Hey, welcome to ETF Edge, your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Fazzani, joined today by Jay Jacobs of Global X Funds, Todd Rosenbluth of CFRA. Let's start today with a major milestone for ETF. It's approaching $4 trillion in market capitalization. Todd, what does this say about the growth of the industry? What, it took two years to go from $3 trillion to $4 trillion, and yet I remind everybody, the mutual fund business is $19 trillion. So right. it's got a long way to go to really catch up with its big rival. Right. We are seeing market share shifts. So we are seeing investors gravitate more towards the lower cost, more passively managed index-based ETFs. So $4 trillion is a huge milestone for the industry. We at CFRA think we're going to see further growth the adoption of fixed income ETFs that's happened thus far in 2019 yep. is a really big deal because we're seeing broad asset allocation strategies using this. Yep. And some of the more trading oriented products really started to pick up in June. Yeah, and, and Jay, that is a surprise. We keep seeing inflows into bond ETFs, but I can't help but notice 2017 and 2018, oceans of money came into ETFs, particularly passive equity indexed uh, in ETFs. There's money coming in in 2019, but it's much slower. It's not negative, but it's much slower. I'm wondering why has it slowed down when there's still compelling reasons? Seems like a lot of people have, still have money in fairly high-priced mutual funds. Yeah, we have to remember that ETFs are highly liquid vehicles, and so they attract many different types of investors. Some people are going to be very long-term buy and hold and like the ETF structure because of its tax efficiency. Other people are going to be very quick, moving a lot of money in and moving a lot of money out. I think this year some of that hot money is maybe staying on the sidelines or looking at different investments rather than using the ETF vehicle. But if we look at the long-term trend, ETFs are still growing very fast. Is that what we're looking at then? So it, it, there's a lot of tactical trading now in ETFs. We, freak, we have to remind people that there are active traders that are moving money in and out of ETFs all the time. And if all of a sudden, we, like December, they decide to move to the sidelines, then the assets under management are going to drop. Right. So we saw that again in May also. So there was outflows towards U.S. equity-oriented ETFs, but they came roaring back in June. So the triple Qs, SPY, were some of the more popular ETFs in general, and we saw strong inflows into those in June. And we think we're going to see that again in the second half if the equity markets continue to perform well. And yet $19 trillion is a long way to go. Mutual funds, $4 trillion in ETFs. Isn't the real problem that mutual funds still own the 401k business without unless you crack the 401k business i don't know how etfs are ever going to come close to mutual funds in terms of assets under management right so the 401k market is largely a buy and hold forever part of it and mutual funds fit in very well there the trading aspects that etf offer are not as appealing the cost structure versus institutional funds so we do really need to see that to see the gap shrink considerably okay let's move on here and turn our attention to the markets the 10 year sitting at two percent as wall street waits a potential rate cut later this month and if you're on the hunt for yield there are etfs for that now, Jay, you run the Global X Super Dividend ETF, ticker SDIV. It consists of 100 global securities and sports a dividend yield of more than 9%. This is amazing. If somebody said to me, hey, how about a, an ETF that has a dividend yield of 9%, consists of big, well-known names, I'd say, sign me up. And yet, the assets under management are fairly small. The, the, you know, the price doesn't move that much compared to some other major indexes. Well, what is the idea here, and, and why does it... Why, do, why aren't people flocking to it? Sure. Well, it seems like a great idea. It, it does have over $900 million in assets under management. So this is not yeah. SPY, but it's not tiny. Um, it fits in a category of what we call high income alternatives. So we've seen a lot of flows this year into fixed income ETFs. And the question is, is that a flight to safety or is that search for yield? We've seen a lot of flows into our high income alternatives, which includes equity dividend payers. It includes covered calls, MLPs. So we think this movement this year, a lot of that shift in ETF assets is looking for yield. And it makes a lot of sense when you consider the macro environment. The Fed may be probably cutting rates two or three times this year. People really need to start to find yield again for their portfolio yeah. to reach their income target. You mentioned alternative yield targets. You have another one, the Global X NASDAQ 100, 100 covered calls. Basically, you're holding NASDAQ 100 stocks, you're turning around and you're selling options on those stocks, you're collecting the money, and you're giving it out to the investors in the form of a, a dividend, essentially. 10%, again, this sounds like, hey, this is fantastic. 
And yet, still, it, it, what's the sort of thing people need to be aware of when they're doing something like this? It sounds like a great idea. Let's sell covered calls. Yeah, it's, it's an alternative strategy. So a lot of advisors, a lot of uh, individual investors do this themselves, but it's a challenge to roll those call options every single month, and ETF is doing that for you. Global X is doing the portfolio management aspect of that. So, Are, are you always guaranteed to make a profit when you're rolling it over? Not necessarily. No, right? absolutely not. I mean, if you look at the way that that ETF works, you're selling the upside and gaining an option premium. So that works very well, especially in volatile markets where those options are more and more valuable. But if you see a huge bull run in the NASDAQ 100, you've traded that upside for the option premium. So yeah. it's a unique strategy for harnessing yield. And, and Todd, I think the important thing is we've talked a lot about dividend appreciation. Right. My, well, my favorite is the SDY. This is the uh, State Street runs it. It's the aristocrats right. uh, dividend uh, ETF. Basically, you take uh, the top uh, 1,500 stocks and then you get 25 consecutive years, the, the, the 50 or so that have increased their dividend the most. Uh, this seems like the way to go. To me, you want companies that are consistently increasing their dividends and take the smallest group that's increasing the most over the last 25 years, and yet the returns against a, 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 you know, a, a S&P 500 have been fairly modest. Yeah, but these are popular products. So SDY is the S&P 1500, NOBL, which is a pro shares product, which is just the S&P 500. You have a very select list of companies companies that have raised a dividend as often as you've had, and you get diversification across a variety of sectors. And we've seen just this so they're year. Not, it's not, it, I'm trying to think what's the proper way to look at it for the investors. It's not that you're seeking outperformance necessarily, price plus dividend. You're seeking what when you, when you do this? Well, so this is a lower risk way of getting diversified equity exposure. So you are getting dividend growers, companies that is earnings have to be strong enough to continue to pay out the dividend. And when we at CFA look inside that, we see a lot of compelling stocks. We've seen Target, T. Rowe Price. These are companies that have raised the dividend for 25 plus years that are part of both these portfolios. Okay, let's move on a little bit because I want to talk about one of my favorite topics and that's robotics. Thematic investing has been a big uh, trend in the last year. ETS focused on hot topics like ESG, environmental, social, and governance, marijuana, and robotics popping up in the market. Joining us now for more, Bill Studebaker. He's the president and the CEO of Robo Global, a fund that specializes in robotics, automation, and AI. And the important thing is that fund is outperforming the S&P 500 this year. Congratulations. There's the outperformance for you. Uh, robotics. Anything robotics seem to be hot right now. Explain the idea behind it and, and how you decide what goes in it. Well, I guess we were fortunate six years ago to have developed an index that tracks the growth in robotics and AI because we saw these technologies changing the way we live and work. Okay, we are on the cusp of ubiquitous automation and we have an undeniable inflection point because of performance capabilities of computing and the cost curve declining such that these now are technologies that used to be science fiction now have actual use applications. So uh, fast forward you know, six years later, and we are at a launching you know, pad in terms of the economic activity that we're seeing and the innovations, and it's being spread out to all parts of the economy, right? Every sector of the economy is gonna benefit from robotics and AI. And we put up some of your, your holdings here, just to give you a, a, a sense, the 2% and a number of them, Oceaneering International, they, they, do, uh, they operate remote vehicles for the energy business, that's robotics. Uh, IPG Photonics, that's a 2% holding. They make lasers. Uh, FLIR Systems, they do thermal imaging and video monitors. Do these all get a substantial part of their revenues from robotics or robotics-like businesses? Definitely. So we try to identify the companies that we think have the highest revenue threshold that corresponds directly to selling the technologies. So we're looking for high revenue purity. We're also looking for you know, a large technological mode around their business. I think we have an interesting lens to capture this. We actually have seven PhDs in our team. They're really the who's who in robotics and AI that have built technologies, built businesses, or academic researchers, et cetera, that give us a great lens to see not what yesterday's winners are, but what the future winners are likely to be. So um, I think that gives us an interesting lens. Well, there's a lot of research that goes in it, understandably, but it's not cheap. It's almost a 1% ex expense ratio. And, you know, that's fairly high overall. Do you feel that's justified given the research you have to do for this? Yeah, listen, we actually charge the official fee is 95 basis points. We do uh, rebate securities lending, which is effectively their 25 basis points. So the actual cost is 70 basis points to investors. With a team of industry experts that we have, tracking this. I think that we do a pretty good job of generating the alpha that investors are looking for. The index yeah. is up a little over 20% year to date. The last three years is probably close to up 15%.
uh, we think the inflection is starting here, and we've got years, if not decades, of growth ahead of us. You, Todd, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, any kind of technological disruptive uh, uh, technology, we could call it, seems to have interest on the part of investors. Will they necessarily pan out in the long run? We had this interest with the Internet craze. 20 years ago. Right. So thematic oriented ETFs. So Global X has a, a robotics ETF as well. iShares has a robotics ETF. We've got a number of other firms that have seen these long term thematic plays and are offering a play to be able to do that. So we think investors need to look at this space, but also look inside. So the holdings that you saw on Robo are not exactly complements of what you'd see from other ETFs. Yeah. Jay, you've also got something similar here BOTZ. Are you seeing in investor interest in this space? I, I love talking talking about this because I think that's where the future is, whether or not they're going to make money in the long term, this group of companies you've assembled is still not clear to me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, investors are future focused, you know, by definition, they want to grow their portfolios and they're looking for where is that growth going to come in the future. Robotics and AI, we think, is one of the most powerful growth engines that we see in the market today. But there's other themes as well, the growth of fintech and what we're seeing in mobile payments, the growth of the IoT, the Internet of Things and 5G are also very powerful themes. So we've been very focused on growing our thematic suite. Bill, before we let you go, you've got a new ETF out, sort of an extension of the Robo brand here just in the last day or two, uh, global healthcare technology. I guess this is the same theme, right? E modified equal weight, quarterly rebalancing. You're looking at healthcare stocks that are disruptive technology involved in, in the robotics industry. I see you have Illumina in here where they do gene sequencing. You have Brooks Automation. They do uh, uh, sample man biological sample management. Uh, you have uh, Ping On Healthcare and Technology. That's that first one there with the uh, orange and the happy face there. They do, uh, they're a virtual care provider, right? right. They do uh, online doctors and things like right. that. So for us, healthcare um, is probably one of the most exciting areas for investors to think about. Why? We're going to a world of prediction, prevention, individualizing medicine. Effectively, we're going to create much healthier livelihoods for us, but more importantly, longer longevity, right? And so we live in a world that's been historically sick care. We deal with the problem after it happens. We're now going to a world of prevention, prediction, and individualizing medicine. A lot of healthcare structures tend to focus on therapies, right? We're actually focused much more on the prediction and the prevention. So diagnosis and, and medical instruments and uh, regenerative medicine and prevention, right? Yeah. And so these are kinds of technologies yeah. that um, investors need to embrace when they're thinking about healthcare. Yeah. The two thematics that seem to matter to me are ESG, that's got a little bit of traction, and I call them technological thematics, like robotics and, and BOTZ. Would you agree, or is there some other thematic aspect that we're missing that we should pay attention to this year? I think those are those key ones. So ESG products have been popular. Some institutional investors have been gravitating towards that. And then more technological products, but that are different than what you'd get in XLK or VGT, the, the heavyweights in the space. So you're not going to find Microsoft and Apple yeah. in some of these more thematic-oriented ETFs. That's exactly what I like about them. Gentlemen, thanks very much. And that does it for this week's ETF Edge. I'm Bob Pisani. My thanks to Jay, to Todd, and to Bill for joining us today. And thank you for watching. You can find all of our latest videos right here on our website, etfedge.cnbc.com. We'll see you next Monday, same time, same place. Have a good week. Get the ABCs of ETFs with the ETF Edge newsletter, your weekly update on the hottest trends in the nearly $4 trillion market of exchange-traded funds, expert analysis, actionable ideas, and exclusive insight from host Bob Pisani. Sign up now at cnbc.com forward slash ETF Edge newsletter.